It is good to sing of the goodness of God at all times, especially just one day into a new year. Let's pray. Lord, all our lives you have been faithful and you have been good. And your goodness is now and has always been running after us. And we confess sometimes we run from it. But on the threshold here of this new year, help us to live in the awareness, presence, and power of your goodness through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Speaking of the goodness of God, there's a lot of things to celebrate. I'm, hopefully you do this. You look back over your life and think about all the good things God has done over the past year. I was talking to somebody as we were standing out there greeting, talking about how she's made her list in her journal of all the good, good things God has done over the past year and years. And in our church family, we have a lot to celebrate as well. Uh, particularly, I want to mention to you, those of you who knew about and prayed for and gave toward our Advent partner, a ministry in the Northern Africa, uh, through our Serve the World partnership, uh, a ministry that's we're building a, a school called Hope School in this war-torn uh, African country. Uh, we set a goal to raise half a million dollars to help them finish the school. That was an ambitious goal. In the past, we've set a goal of quarter million dollars, $300,000, and you have given above and beyond that. This was far and away more than we'd ever set as a goal or than you'd ever given before. And I just want to praise God and thank all of you that you gave $528,000 to that project. So, yeah, it, I was not sure that we'd hit the goal. But, you know, whatever, we, whatever God gives through his people is what, we, you know, we just trust him with that. But I was talking to my wife about it, and, and then I told her what the number was, and she said, you didn't trust God, did you? I'm like, mm, no, I didn't. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I, so praise God for his generosity and, and uh, his, his goodness through all of you. I want to say thank you for that. Um, there's a lot to celebrate, and we'll tell you more of those stories as we go forward. You know, it's a, it's an, I don't know how many of you stayed up till midnight. Anybody? Passed? Yeah? Oh, look at you. And you're here in church. Good for you. And those joining online, at least you made it online. Good for you, right? Uh, I, those days were kind of over for me. I stayed up to watch the end of the, the second playoff game for the NCAA playoffs. And that was around 11, 11, 15 or so. And then I fell asleep. And then I woke up to the sound of people shooting off fireworks and screaming and yelling in my neighborhood. I'm like, what, what, I don't, what is it about a new year? I mean, I know. But seriously, if you stop and think about it, why do we think that turning the calendar over is going to make everything better? Like, like it, it, at 11.59, it's the same terrible 2023, 2022, right? And then one minute later, 2023, hope springs eternal. It's all going to be better and different now. As followers of Jesus, we, should, we know better, or we should know better. We should know better that our hope is not in the turning over of a calendar, but in the ever unchanging love of God in Christ Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with the threshold of a new year, setting new goals, thinking back on what God has done, looking forward to what he will do. That's all good. But we make a mistake as followers of Jesus if we think that just something, there's something magic about a calendar flip. Time marches on. It's inexorably moving toward the day when he will return. And his love and his faithfulness and his grace are steadfast and constant in every moment of every day of every year. We just don't always see that. And what about New Year's resolutions? Anybody make them yet? <laughs> You're just not going to put your hand up. Right? <laughs> well, are you hedging? I don't know how much I want to be disappointed in myself, so I'm thinking about if I should make it. 65% of people who make New Year's resolutions believe they will keep them. 88% of those who do fail to do so. <laughs> so, like, 60% of the time, it works every time, right? <laughs> I think the reason that we have a renewed hope at, at the new year and we make resolutions is because there's something in us as human beings, as people, that longs for things to be better in the world than they are, hoping this year will be better, and not just out there, but in here, a longing that I'll be better than I am. Why do you make it? If we kept all our New Year's resolutions, you'd all be perfect. You'd all be super fit and healthy and well-read and amazing, like all the things that you've resolved to do that we wouldn't need anymore. But we know deep down inside, I'm not as I should be. I long to be better than I am. And so I resolve, right, again and again. But as Christians, we know that that's coming from a deep place, a longing for the world and for ourselves to be better than we are. And we can be, is the hope of the gospel. I think that's the reason we do this. So I want to take us to a passage of Scripture, praying about like what well, we have this sort of, this weak New Year's Day that stands alone. What, what is it that God would say to us through his word? There's lots of places we could go. 
But I, I think this is maybe the perfect passage for, for our hearts as we stand in the first day of a new year. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. I'll read it for us. Not that I've already obtained all this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made, has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is a remarkable passage. It fits into a context where Paul's talking about in the previous verses his, uh, what he used to think were to his credit earlier in Philippians chapter 3. All those things he used to think were what he, he, he sort of anchored his self-worth and significance and meaning in. And then at the end in chapter, 10, or chapter 3 verse 10 and 11, he says, my, my goal, my aim, my desire is to know Christ. The power of his resurrection. To become like him in his death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Like his central goal for his life is to know Jesus Christ more and more. And that's what he means when he says, go back to that screen for a minute, I have already obtained this. He says, I have not already obtained it. It's an amazing chapter. I would encourage you, if you don't already have a a New Year's reading plan, start your new year by reading Philippians uh, chapter 3. What Paul says he used to bank on and what he's focused on now in his life. This is Paul's life resolution, not just for a new year, but for his whole life, to know Jesus Christ. Now I want to share with you four encouragements, four encouragements for a new year from this passage. If you're a note taker, maybe you've got your, your Chapel Street Journal, jot these things down. If you've got your phone out, however you want to do it, or go back and watch this later. First, humbly admit that you have not arrived yet. As you start a new year, humbly admit, I'm not there yet. Some of you are probably thinking, no problem, I got that one covered. I know I haven't arrived. He tells me, she tells me all the time. (laughs) In verse 12, we go back to the passage again. In verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this. Look what Paul says here. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. He's not already perfect. He's not already made it. It would be hard to think of uh, somebody more spiritually devoted than the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's writing this from prison, and he's in prison because he's sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived yet. I do not consider, in verse 13 down here, he says, I do not consider that I've made it my own. I'm not there, I haven't arrived, I haven't obtained it, I haven't yet made it my own. He still doesn't think that he's gotten there yet. Now you're probably thinking, well, I know I'm not perfect. And I think it's a mark of spiritual immaturity for Christians who think, I'm doing pretty well. And most of us who think we're doing pretty well, we we think that because we're comparing ourselves to who? To God? To each other. And we choose the lowest common denominator, right? I'm better than that guy. Have you seen the way she behaves? Have you seen what she posts online? I'm better than her. I've been a Christian for a little over almost 40 years. And I know that I haven't made it yet. I have not yet lived the life that God desires for me and that deep down inside I want to live. That doesn't mean I'm not growing. It means I haven't arrived. I haven't obtained it. I have not yet lived the life that God's called me to live. And I've been walking with Jesus with fits and starts, two steps forward, one step back for 40 years. Have you arrived? If you have, you you could just tune out or you can leave now, go have brunch. Only the most immature and shallow Christians think of themselves as doing really well. In fact, the truth is, the more that we grow, we talk around here about experiencing grace, growing in faith, and making an impact. The reality is the more that you grow in Christ, the more you realize, I've got a long way to go. I'm not there yet. There's a lot that God has, a lot of work he needs to do still in me. So Paul wants the Philippians to know that he's with them on the journey. He's not like some spiritual super giant that they could never measure up to. I haven't obtained it, he says, and neither have you. We're together in this journey. 
Some of us might be farther along a bit than others, might be a little further down the road, but none of us have arrived. None of us have obtained it. We're all on this journey of pursuing Jesus together. I think one of the things that sometimes is a challenge is people come to church and they assume that those who are up here or those who are the teaching and leading in whatever context, oh, they're the super Christians. It is not so. There are no such thing. One of the things that when you, happens in our lives when you humbly admit that you have not arrived yet is you, start, you stop seeing all the problems with other people. And you start seeing the grace of God in their life. And boy, we need this. When you humbly admit, I have not arrived yet. God has work to do in me. I have a lot of growing to do and I'm on the path. Then you look at other people's lives and you stop seeing all of their problems. And you start seeing the grace of God at work in their lives. You become less critical and judgmental and slower to see their faults, faster to see your own. Second, Don't give up on becoming who God calls you to be. So the first, humbly admit that you have not arrived yet. Second, don't give up on becoming who God calls you to be. I'm sure some of you might be thinking of that first one. Yeah, yeah, fine. I I can admit I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But sometimes Christians, well, wouldn't say this. Sometimes those of us who kind of come to church regularly and do the religious thing, we use that as a, a subconscious excuse for being passive. I, oh, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm not, you're not, so therefore, we sort of excuse ourselves that we haven't grown. I mean, it'd be easy to think, well, if, I, if I've lived as a Christian for 40 years, 50 years, 30 years, whatever it is for you, and you think, well, I haven't arrived yet, maybe you start to think, well, I, I never will. If I haven't gotten there now, what's the point of this? That is not Paul's response. He says, brothers and sisters, I have not obtained this, but what is he responding? He goes, therefore, I'm giving up. Therefore, I'm just gonna kind of coast. Therefore, I am what I am, and that's all that, as good as it's gonna get. Not at all what he says. Look again at verses 12 through 14. Not that I've obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but what? But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. So Paul says, I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm not done, and he's not done with me. Notice, Paul responds by saying, it's precisely because I haven't arrived yet that I press on. You are not yet the woman or the man that God wants you to be. I think you probably know that. You don't need me to tell you. You came in here knowing that. And that, that's not, when you hear that from the gospel, that's not a word of guilt of condemnation. That's a word of encouragement. You are not yet as God desires you to be. So press on because he's not done with you. Pursue Christ. I, I, I've been thinking about this. There is a fuller and deeper life of devotion to Jesus available for me that I've not yet experienced. Do you believe that for yourself? There is a fuller and deeper life of devotion to Jesus Christ that whatever age you are, however long you've been a Christian, that you have not yet experienced. You, to know his love more, to experience his grace more, to know that you're forgiven, be assured of your salvation, to see the good in other people, to trust that he's at work even when things are tough, to know that he's listening to your prayers, to have a deep inner confidence of his love and his presence and his work in you and in the world. I wanna live that way. Do you? Paul is saying, that's available to me, and I press on for that. Not to earn God's favor. He already has that at the cross. That's why we'll celebrate communion when we close. But to know in a more deep and full way, to live out of that reservoir of his love. I press on. I press in. I want more. I'm not satisfied with where I am right now. When I used to coach football, uh, as a volunteer coach in a local high school, 
you know, you'd, you'd always see in those, the athletes you coached more than they see in themselves sometimes. You see what they could become. You desire more for them. And I was always telling those young men, I believe in you. Wanting them to believe in themselves, wanting them to work for this. There's a sense in which God is saying to us through his word, I see more for you than you see for yourself. Press on. Trust me. Look at the, here in Philippians 3, Paul says this is essentially a lifelong pursuit. Go after Jesus. Pursue him. Often we talk here about that the gospel means not what we do, but what Christ has done. That you can do nothing to earn his love or favor. And that's true. That's the foundation. That's the bedrock. That's why the cross is at the center here. But that doesn't mean you have nothing to do. That doesn't mean we're just passively waiting around for him to change us. That's the very motivation by which we press on. Look at how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Listen to the imagery here. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run, and I know in our culture that's not popular, right? Everybody gets a prize. But Paul says it different here. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul's drawing a parallel, a comparison here between physical training and a physical race and the spiritual life. When I was a freshman at Wheaton College, I was a total knucklehead. I mean, I was a Focused on myself, meathead, football playing. Not, I was not the spiritual mature giant you see before me today. <laughs> if you knew me then. And the, the quarterback on the team, Ben Firm, was my small group leader. And he wrote down a little three by five card this verse, 1 Timothy 4, 7. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things, holding promise for this life and the life to come. And he wrote on the back of that little card, if you would train yourself, Jeff, the way, uh, spiritually the way you do physically, there's nothing God can't do through your life. Uh, he's a guy that I admired. He's a senior captain quarterback. Wrote that to me, gave it to me. I've remembered that verse all these years. Right? Paul's drawing a par parallel here between physical discipline and spiritual discipline. Make your life count. Go after Jesus. He's worth pursuing with all that you have. Don't beat the air aimlessly or chase after things that are not worth your time. Go after him. Don't give up becoming who God calls you to be. That's what he's saying to us. You don't need to earn God's favor. It's not earning. So the, the Christian life is not a matter of earning, but it is a matter of effort. It does require something of you. His love and his grace calls you to more. In fact, if you think about it, the best things in our lives require the most from us, don't they? The very best things in your life, if you're blessed with a spouse here this morning, that requires something of you. Some sacrifice, some service, some selflessness. Those of you who are blessed to be parents or grandparents, that requires something of you, doesn't it? Giving of yourself. The very best, a good friendship, a dear friend, a true sister or brother in the Lord requires something of you. The best things in our lives require the most from us. Why would we think it would be different in our spiritual life? And it's worth it. He's worth pursuing. There are so many things crying out for or demanding our time and attention. Only one is worth chasing after. Number three. So, number one, it humbly admit that you have not arrived yet. Number two, don't give up becoming who God has called you to be. And number three, don't let your past hold you back from pursuing Jesus. Don't let your past hold you back from pursuing Jesus. Look again at verse uh, 13, Philippians 3, 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Look at what he says. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on, he says, forgetting what lies behind. Now, when Paul says forgetting, he doesn't mean pretend it never happened. 
He's talking about that no longer defines me. That's not gonna hold me back. It is so easy and so common. The best way to live a life that is wasted and unfulfilled is to be stuck in the past. And there's lots of ways this happens. Sometimes you're stuck in the past of your own failures. If you knew what I've done. Or if it's stuck in the past of things done to you. Wounds that you can't release and you can't forgive and you feel like there's been this terrible injustice done to you. Or maybe it's even the past of your own successes. You, you just become, believe the, like we would always tell our, the athletes as a coach, right? Don't believe all the press clippings. You're not that great, you know? So I believe in you, but uh, you're not as good as you could yet become. One time when I was, I'll just, this is not part of the notes, but here you go. One time when I was, a, I was a, a freshman in college, I was playing football at Wheaton College, and I went in to see my coach, Coach Swider, and I, I was split in time with a senior ahead of me, and I thought I was better than him, and I probably was, but, uh, but, I, but, I, but that wasn't the point. <laughs> and I went, I went see, I still have some growing to do. And I went in to see, and I, I, in film sessions, the coach would say to me, Frazier, he'd pause it, look at yourself. We can't win like that, that's terrible. And I'd be getting blocked or missing a tackle or something. And then he would, the other player, who I won't name, he would, he would say, oh, that's great job, great job. But he never criticized him. And I thought it was so unjust. So I went in to see coach, to demand like justice. <laughs> what a knucklehead. So I said, you know, I, and I said this, and he said, sit down. So I sat down. He said, look, Fritzy's got five games left. If I started getting, riding on him, telling him how bad he is, what's that going to help? I want him to play like a stud. He's got five games left in his career. You, however, Frazier, already think you're something that you're not. But I see what you could be. So I am going to ride you and criticize you and get the most out of you. He was exactly right. Exactly right. Now, when Paul says forgetting what lies behind... He's talking not only about failures and wounds, but also successes. Earlier in chapter three, he talks about those things he used to see to his credit. We can be held back by all kinds of things in our past. Remember who's writing this, by the way. You know what Paul's name was before he's named the apostle Paul? Some of you know. Saul of Tarsus. What was Saul famous for? Persecuting Christians. He was an opponent of the church, hostile to the claims of Jesus Christ, dead set against it. His life's mission was to wipe these Christians out. So think about who writes this, forgetting what lies behind. You think you have some stuff in your past that you're ashamed of and you regret and you wish it hadn't happened or you hadn't done? I challenge you to stack it up against the Apostle Paul. Calls himself the chief of sinners. Yet, he's saying, that is no longer me. I press on, I forget that stuff. It def- doesn't define me. I'm not stuck back there. It's been forgiven. I've been set free. The gospel is more powerful than your past. I'm gonna say that again. The gospel is more powerful than your past. In fact, turn to the person next to you. And say these words. Comfortably because it's part of us doesn't want to believe that's true. But it is true. Past failures, past wounds, and past successes. This is similar to what the prophet Isaiah wrote 700 years earlier. Speaking to the people of God who had failed collectively. Who had failed to live up to the covenant call of God in their lives. Isaiah 43, he says, forgetting the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And at the end of verse 13, Paul uses this phrase, if you go back to that verse 13 for a minute, and straining forward. The Greek word here is a word that means to reach, to grasp for. The image of a runner straining for the tape at the finish line. Stretching out. That's what he's saying here. The Christian life is a life of moving forward, of straining forward, of pursuit. A good prayer maybe for us to pray in this new year. God, take everything in my life, including all that's happened in my past, all my mistakes, all my wounds, and all my successes. Take all of it, Lord, and use it for your purpose, however you see fit, from this point forward. 
You know, the image of a runner running in a race. How often do you see, like in the, in the Olympics, runners running near the finish line, turning around and looking behind them, and looking behind them? You ever see that? You ever see Olympic runners turning around? Almost never. You ever see sprinters doing that? Hey, they're going to get beat if they do that. What are they doing? Focused, straining. Maybe in a marathon, if they have a good lead, they might look over their shoulder once. But the whole point is, eyes focus forward. It was the writer of Hebrews says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him did not despise the cross. He endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Like, like laser focus. The one thing the new year ought to tell us is, you are one year closer to death than you were before. <laughs> hey, it's true. You are one page flipped closer to meeting God face to face, to seeing Jesus. Your life matters, it counts. No time to waste, no coasting. Eyes forward, focused on the finish line. Press on. Number four, and, and most important of all, so if we say number one is that humbly admit I have not arrived yet. Number two, don't give up on becoming the person God's called you to be. Number three, you're, don't let your past, whatever's in your past, hold you back from pursuing Jesus. And number four, and this is really the key, never lose sight of the wonder and power of the gospel. It's easy to miss in this passage. It could feel like it's all about effort and striving, and I gotta work hard, I gotta run hard, I gotta make it there, but that's not the heart of what Paul's saying. He is calling us to a life of purpose and passion and focus, but the, the energy, the motivation, the power for this doesn't come from your strength. It doesn't come from inside of you. It comes from Christ. Let's look again at the passage. Not that I've already obtained all this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because what? Christ Jesus has made me his own. Like this is the whole ball game, friends. Paul says, I press on to make it, the, the gospel, my life, Jesus, my own because he's already claimed me. I'm already his. He's already made me his own. And that's why you can press on. Otherwise, it's just a matter of work harder, be better, do more. Happy New Year, go, right? <laughs> there's, there's no power to change anybody's life. Paul is saying, I know. In fact, that, that Greek word obtained uh, up here, make it my own, obtained, is the Greek word katalambazo. Same word in John chapter one, the darkness has, the light has shined in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it or overcome it. Same Greek word. It could mean grasp, comprehend, obtain, take hold of. In fact, the NIV translates this, taking hold of. Paul is saying, Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. He has me. And therefore I press on to take hold of him. Therefore I want more of him. Because I'm secure in his grip. Because he's got me. That's the motivation he's saying. The energy and passion with which you pursue Christ this year comes from the fact that he's already pursued you and claimed you and won you at the cross. God has not called you to remain where you are. Do you believe that? You know, one of the saddest things to me is some, sometimes the longer people are in church, the more complacent they get about where they are, spiritually speaking. Just going through the motions, doing the stuff. Very often I observe that those who are new to faith are passionate about growing in Christ, full of joy and wonder at the gospel, can't get enough of the word of God, want to share their faith, want to grow. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes those of us who've been around a while doing this, we sort of settle in, accepting mediocrity. What you, 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 you would think, the longer you walk with Jesus, the more you want of him. We're doing something wrong if it's, we're coasting and, it's, and we're stuck. Paul says, I press on to take hold of Christ Jesus because he's already taken hold of me. 
because he's already made me his own. I belong to him. I'm secure in his love. So I'm not trying to earn anything. I've already got it. But I am trying to know more of him. I, have, I do want to experience more of his grace. And the good news is that's what he wants for you. Look at what Paul says. I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call. Life here on earth is not always up and to the right. The economy should prove that to us. In our lives, there's setbacks, there's difficulties, there's challenges, there's peaks and valleys. I'm looking at some of you, and I know your stories. I know you know that's true. But over the long haul, like the trajectory of your life is an upward call in Christ Jesus. And here's the reality. If you live just for this life and this world, and this is one of the great obstacles in suburban Christianity. If you live just for this life, you know what happens? Life grows slowly, inexorably darker for you. Because, why? If you're, if you're living for this life, you are slowly but surely losing this life. You're, you're headed toward the end of it. So if your life is now, here and now, all that all all this world has to offer, you're going to lose it. You will lose it. Doesn't mean you can't have great moments and achieve great wealth and have lots of fun times and post cool things on social media. But you're losing it. Inevitably. Nobody keeps it. But the, the call and power of the gospel is if you live for Christ, your life is inexorably, little by little, full of more and more light. Why? Because you're moving closer and closer to him. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If, if I live, it's because he wants me to live for his purpose and glory. If I die, I, I gain. I get Jesus. Oh, I get to live? Well, I live for him. That's awesome because it's his purpose and glory. Oh, you want me to kill me? Fine, I get to be with Jesus. You can't touch him, in other words. And he knows that every day of his life, every turning of a calendar year is moving him closer to Jesus which is the goal anyway. I, I say that to you not as somebody who lives that way all the time. Like you, I get distracted. I get consumed by the cares of this world and the stuff of this life. But I've been thinking about that. Here, here's how C.S. Lewis puts it in Mere Christianity. A continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. But one of the things every Christian is meant to do. It does not mean we are to leave the present world as it is. In fact, if you read history, you will find that Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most and focused most about the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the next life that they have become so ineffectual in this life. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. Most people, if they had really learned to look deep in their own hearts, would know they do want and do want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. And there are all sorts of things in this world that promise and offer to give it to you, but they never live up to their promises. Only Christ does. So Paul's saying, like my singular goal, I love this last phrase. We go back to that passage one more time. He says this phrase, but one thing I do. I can't help but think of the movie City Slickers when I read that phrase, right? Some of you know. Yeah. The secret of life is this. Your finger? No. Right? <laughs> one thing. Paul says, one thing I do. He's a one thing man. M might we be one thing people in 2023? Singularly passionate about Jesus. And so I'll just ask you this question, since we talked in the opening about resolutions. What's one thing you can do to make the one thing more central in your life? If, if indeed, and maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you're like, hey, I'm just checking out church. But if indeed you want Christ to be central and you want to live like the Apostle Paul's calling us to live, to press on, to press in to more of Christ, and you want him to be your one thing, then just ask yourself, what's one thing I could do 
to make the one thing more central in my heart. It might be, I'm gonna get here. <laughs> I'm gonna show up in Christian community because I've been, I've been drifting. It might be, I'm gonna get here. <laughs> I'm gonna get into his word because quite frankly, I only get it when I go up to a sermon every other week. Or it might be, I'm, I'm gonna start praying. I need a prayer life. What's your one thing? I, I wanna live like the apostle Paul calls us to live because the father has drawn you the Son has redeemed you, and the Spirit has empowered you to press on. So we're going to close the service by, by coming to the table, which is the, really the perfect way. That last fourth point, never lose the wonder and power of the gospel. It's the power of gospel that is our motivational center. That is what moves us forward. And to those watching online, uh, I encourage you to get the elements ready in your own homes to prepare to come and receive bread and cup where you are. For those of you here, we don't do it this way very often, but today we're going to do this. We've set aside some time. Uh, there's no service coming after this one. And so uh, we're going to let you come forward to receive communion. In a few, we're going to read through a confessional prayer. And then I'm going to pray and invite you forward. And you can come as a couple, as individuals, as a family. You can take the elements right here. There's cup on top, and they're, they're packaged together, the bread on the bottom. You can kneel down, you can go back to your seat, you don't have to be in a hurry. And you can wait right in your seat until the line's down if you want. We're gonna be here until everybody's had a chance to come forward. But I think it's good for us to get up out of our chairs and to come forward. Now, if you, if you physically can't come forward, just put your hand up and ushers will come and, and serve you as well. But let this be a, a, a symbol, a way of us saying, Jesus, I want you to be my one thing this year. There's lots of things, right? There's lots of stuff. But more than all that, I want you to be central in my life. And remember what the Apostle Paul said. I, you and I press on to take hold of him who has already taken hold of you at the cross. So if you're here and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you've trusted him for forgiveness, you are welcome to come and take communion. Let's prepare our hearts for this reading from Psalm 130. I'll, I'll lead and you respond with these words. You'll see it on, on the screen collectively. Out of the depths of, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Wait on you. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that we're distracted by many things. Sometimes we're stuck in the past. But here today, we resolve to press on, to press in further into your love and your grace. We thank you that we can only do this because you have already claimed us and made us your own. You've taken hold of us by your grace and forgiven our sin and redeemed us. And so now we come to your table and remember that you, Jesus, are the bread of life. And as we eat the bread, we remember your sacrifice on the cross for our sin. And as we drink the cup, we will remember that you are living water that the cup is the cup of the new covenant of your shed blood for our forgiveness and freedom. And as we do this, we also remember that we are proclaiming the truth of your death and resurrection until we meet you again. We thank you, Jesus, our one and only thing. Amen. Anton will play. You may come as you're ready.